I'm going to invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of Philippians, chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 is our text today, and uh, if you don't have a Bible with you that is, and you're in the building, that's perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you, turn to page 1,164, and you will find uh, the text that we're going to be looking at. You'll be able to follow along. And, uh, and if you don't have a Bible and you're in the room, then take one of those with you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Now, if you're joining us online, uh, we feel the same exact way about you. It's not quite as easy for us to put a Bible in your hand, but if you need a Bible and you want one, just let us know and we will get you one. We're that committed to people having and reading and applying God's Word. Hey, uh, let me just tell you something real quick. Uh, first of all, the, the, most of the team leading us tonight in worship is our Parker Campus worship team. And... Uh, you know, I, am, I just am amazed at the, the talent that God surrounds me with. Someone who doesn't have any talent really appreciates people who do. And uh, so uh, I am thankful for that. But I'm really thankful for what God is doing in, in Parker, through our Parker campus. Pastor Reuben is doing a fantastic job, and God is, is working in amazing ways. Keep praying for them, uh, and pray especially that God would give us a permanent location in Parker where we can do the ministry and, and see that expand. So uh, I, am, I am thrilled about that. Hey, one other thing I got to tell you, and it's kind of good news. If you've been thinking about praying about going with us to the Holy Land in November... Israel announced this week that they're actually opening back up for tourists. And right now they've got 1,001 rules, but you know, those will you know, hopefully come down to you know, under 1,000 by the time we go. But if you are uh, still interested, thinking about it, uh, grab a brochure, uh, see me, uh, email me, and we'd love to take you and explore and experience the land where Jesus walked on this earth. And it is a great discipleship, growing uh, spiritual experience, and I would love to take all of you with me. I know only some of you can go, but uh, what a great time and a great way to celebrate your faith. So if you're interested, check that out as well. Um, by the way, one of the things that people always ask me when we go to Israel is, is it secure? Is it safe? And uh, can I just tell you that we, as a people, crave security. We want to know that we are safe and secure. So we lock our doors and our windows. We install security systems to protect us. We purchase weapons to protect us. We get our concealed carry permit so we can be protected everywhere we go. Uh, and, 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 you know, look, that, that's, that's important. Personal security is important. By the way, we have a security team here at Calvary because we think security is important. But can I just tell you the most dangerous thing of any trip I have ever taken people on? I've taken people to crazy places around the world on missions, and the most dangerous, they always go, is it dangerous? I go, look, if we survive the drive to here in Vegas, <laughs> that, that's the most dangerous part of the trip. By the way, we, we freak out about security, but the most dangerous thing that all of us do is drive. That, I mean, that, that, let's just be honest, that the odds are not in your favor if you're talking about how you might go uh, in a way that you don't want to go. So I, I'm just saying, we, we want security. We want assurances about our health. You know, am I going to be stay healthy? Am I going to be able to be healthy? Am I going to eat healthy? Am I going to, you know, I don't want to get sick of this. I don't want to do that. Can I just promise you one thing will happen? You will die. Okay, I know, some of you are like, yeah, but if Jesus comes back before I die, then I get to escape that. That is absolutely true. But seeing the age of most of you in this room, the odds are not in your favor. <laughs> yeah, just trying to be honest here. We're all about truth. So um, it's appointed when a man wants to die and then judgment. So uh, that's, the, that's scripture. That's not me. So here's the thing. You might die sick. You might die healthy but you're gonna go. Uh, we want assurances about our finances. We want that financial security. But have you noticed that the more you have, <laughs> the more you can lose? So uh, it just kinda increases, you know, we want security, we get it, and then we're worried about it. We want security in our relationships, that our families are gonna be united and happy and healthy. And, and that's a great goal. That's a great desire. But the truth is, you can control exactly one person in this world, and that's the one inhabiting your space. And we're not really good at that, are we? 
We try to control our spouse because we want them to, look, you cannot guarantee they're going to be faithful. You can't guarantee they're going to work out. You can't guarantee. It takes two to make a great marriage. It takes one to wreck it. Okay, that, that, that's just reality. But you can do everything in your power to make that happen. But, but you got to trust somebody. You can't control your kids. You want your kids to do this, do that. You can't control that. Look, you, you can't control them when they live in your house. You definitely can't control them when they move out. So, uh, you know, we, we want security, and yet we live in a world that is unsafe, unpredictable, and uncertain. And yet, in the midst of all that uncertainty, isn't it good that we celebrate the promise of heaven? See, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of this world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sin, that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you are promised heaven. I mean, heaven is your eternal destiny, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have what? Eternal life. Eternal life. I mean, that's the promise of Jesus. And, and so that's your destiny. But in my years as a pastor, I have discovered numerous followers of Jesus who lack assurance in their salvation, who have questions about whether they're going to make it, whether, whether they're really eternally secure. So today I want to offer, hopefully convincingly, reason for you to live with assurance of salvation, for you to have eternal security. Our text is Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. I want you to, to hear this because it is, it's so clear, so obvious, so blunt that it, it makes perfect sense. The Apostle Paul writes, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, if we experience a life-changing relationship with Jesus, that relationship is forever. Okay, I'm gonna say that again. If you experience that life-changing relationship with Jesus, then that relationship is forever. That's what Paul said, that's what Jesus said. Uh, now notice I didn't say if you pray a certain prayer. Notice that I did not say if you get baptized or if you attend, or if you join a church, or if you give to a church. It's none of those things that qualify you. It is the life-changing grace of God given to us through Jesus Christ. That is what qualifies us for eternal life. That's why we talk about a life-changing relationship with Jesus. If you have that life-changing relationship, it's forever. Now, honestly, if you don't know if you have a life-changing relationship with Jesus, we can't offer you any assurance. All right? and, and I grew up in churches that tried to. And, it, and looking back on it, it, it bothers me greatly because the too many times I would say, well, if you pray this prayer, you're going to go to heaven. And can I just tell you, the Bible doesn't say that. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that. Nowhere in Scripture is there a sinner's prayer. Now, it says if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. But, but there's a, a choice that can only happen by the person who's making it, and it doesn't mean saying the right words. It doesn't mean going through the right actions. So we want you to know that Jesus has changed your life. We want you to know for certain that your sins are forgiven. We want you to, to understand that heaven is your eternal destiny. And that's why we ask you to do the things we do. If you want to have a conversation about Jesus, fill out the connection cards. We will, we will call you. We will harass you. Okay? Because we, we want to have that conversation. You know, that's why we encourage you. Almost every service, talk to the prayer team that's here after the service. They would love to pray with you, talk with you. They can explain to you how Jesus has changed their life and how, you, how he can change your life. That's why we beg you to come see us out by the connection centers and say, ask us questions. Tell us that you've made this decision. We want to talk with you because we want you to have that certainty. Now, if you know that Jesus has changed your life, 
Okay, we've already described how that. If you're certain, you're like, okay, I've, I've trusted Jesus as Savior. I know my sins are forgiven. I know that he's, he's my Savior, Lord. Then please stop questioning your salvation. Please stop living in that, that area of uncertainty because God will finish what he starts. Okay, God will finish what he starts. Did, did, I, I'm just gonna read it again because it's, again, it's so plain. And I am sure of this. Paul says, I'm sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So if you're sure that Jesus has changed your life, guess what, who's gonna finish it? Jesus is gonna finish it. That's the guarantee. See, the moment you confess Jesus is Lord, God the Holy Spirit enters your life, and he's the one who wipes the slate clean, he's the one who transfers the righteousness of God to you, and, and the sin that was paid for by Jesus is removed, and he starts remaking you in the image of Jesus. That's what he's doing. Uh, he makes you that new creation, and the, and the scriptures teach us about the Holy Spirit. The scriptures teach us that the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts of sin. He's the one who convicts of sin. Jesus said in, in John chapter 16, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings conviction. See, it's not my job to convict you. It's not my job to, to make you feel like, oh, I should change something. That's the job of the Holy Spirit who is in you. He will speak conviction into your life. I don't have that responsibility. It's not what I'm supposed to do. Now, here's what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about people who are never convicted about anything. You're like, I, I've got a clean conscience, and I never feel like uh, you know, God's telling me to change. Then I'm not sure God's in your life. Because the Holy Spirit, Spirit will not leave me alone. And if you're a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit probably won't leave you alone. Because he convicts of sin. So the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. The Holy Spirit also teaches truth. Again, Jesus in John 16 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. When the spirit of truth comes, he will lead you into truth. Okay? That's his job. Look, my job as a pastor is to teach truth. Okay? Look, the, the teaching pastors, all the pastors here at Calvary, we're responsible before God holding to a higher accountability, according to Scripture, to teach the Word of God accurately. Okay, we are accountable to God for that. So we, we got to teach truth. I'm going to teach truth to the best of my ability. Um, but it is the Holy Spirit who applies it to our lives for us to understand. Let me say that again. It is the Holy Spirit's job to teach you what you need to hear. It's not my job to teach you what you need to hear. So uh, after the service, and it happens to all of us teaching pastors, whenever we're, we're sharing from Scripture, after the service, somebody will say, were you spying on me last week? Were you listening into our conversations? Because you were talking right to me. And, and here's my response, and a lot of you can, can vouch for this. I just go, I'm glad you're listening to the Holy Spirit. Because if, if like, I'm teaching truth, I don't, I'm not a stalker. Okay, now, maybe the way I pursued my wife back in high school could qualify now, but I'm not going to go there. Um, but I'm not, stalk I'm, like, I'm not stalking you. I'm not, I don't have time to listen to your conversations. I'm a sinner like you are, so I know what you're fighting. I know what you're battling. But, but here's the thing. When you feel like the sermon's directed right to you, that's the Holy Spirit taking the truth that applies to everybody, and he's making it personal to you. So good job for listening to the Holy Spirit. Now you need to go out and apply what he's teaching you because that's how it really changes your life. So the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. The Holy Spirit teaches truth and the Holy Spirit guarantees salvation. The Holy Spirit guarantees salvation. Yeah, Ephesians chapter one, the apostle Paul says, in him, in Jesus, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Jesus, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of God's glory. Did, did you catch that? It's the Holy Spirit who seals us and guarantees our inheritance. So as a, as a follower of Jesus... 
Okay? If, if you already identified yourself, okay, I'm a follower of Jesus, that means when you, when you confess Jesus, God the Holy Spirit seals your life and he guarantees the promises of God will happen in your life. I mean, that is so cool. That is such good news. I mean, I, I, I hope you're hearing this because this is not a preacher guarantee. This is not a church guarantee. This is a God guarantee. The God who began the saving work in you guarantees he will finish the work until we arrive in heaven and we get new bodies and we are 100% redeemed. That ought to, yeah, that ought to make you happy. Because here's the truth. Even though I am faithless, God is faithful. See, my salvation is not dependent on me, okay? I'm saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. It is a gift. I didn't do anything to earn it, so I am saved by grace. But here's this. We're also kept by grace. Because the Holy Spirit's in us, and he goes, I don't care how bad you are, you're still mine. And I'm not letting go of you, and I'm not getting rid of you, and I guarantee that I'm gonna drag your stinky butt all the way to heaven. Okay? Okay? I didn't even write that in there. I don't know how that <laughs> jumped out. See, this is good news because I am a faithless moron. I am a scum-sucking pig sinner, and I need this. And, and that gives me that assurance of eternal security. And here's the thing. If you're a follower of Jesus, it gives you assurance that you're going to go to heaven one day to be with Jesus. Now, some of you are going, that's great news. But it leads to the question, what about people who fall away? What about people who fall away? I always get this, you know, what about people who at one point claim to be Christians and they're not walking with God anymore? What about them? The Bible kind of addresses it. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Galatians 5, same apostle who wrote those words, said this. Uh, he was talking about, you know, uh, grace and legalism to the church at Galatia. And he says, if you embrace circumcision, if you try to be saved by works, you've fallen from grace. Now, scarier passage, a little bit more uh, intense passage is in Hebrews chapter 6, and the writer of Hebrews, uh, and, and he says this in the beginning of verse 4, he says, for it is impossible, those are strong words, by the way, it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. You go, what? What is he saying? Now, Hebrews 6 is a challenging passage written in perilous times because what was going on in the early church is this. Uh, you know, at one, at, at one point, the Roman Empire finally realized Christianity is growing and spreading and it's creating an issue because these people are calling Jesus Lord and we want people to proclaim Caesar is Lord. And once it became uh, a, a spreading faith through the Gentile people, uh, Rome got involved and, and then they started actually persecuting the Christians and they started bringing people before the, the councils and the magistrates and the governors and they wanted them to proclaim Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. That, that's what they wanted. They, you proclaim Caesar is Lord, you go about your life. Uh, we don't really care what else you say as long as you agree that Caesar is Lord. Well, you know what? If you're a follower of Jesus, you can't say that because you know Jesus is Lord. And so you would stand there and you would go, okay, uh, I can't, Say Caesar is Lord. I can't burn incense to Caesar. I can't honor him as a God. Uh, Jesus is Lord. And they go, well, if you don't renounce Jesus and honor Caesar, we're going to kill you. We're going to drag you into the arena. We're going to, you know, you're going to suffer and die because you refuse to uh, renounce Jesus. Okay, that was the setting. And there were people who walked away from the faith to save their life. Okay, there were people who walked away from Jesus to save their life. And you go, well, that's, that's apostasy, okay? That's, that's what they called apostasy. How do we understand what they're doing? Because the words of Jesus really strongly influenced me at this point. In Matthew 10, Jesus said, talking to his 
disciples, to his followers, he said, you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. And when they deliver you over, do not be anxious for how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. You know how I interpret that? You know what I think? I think if the Holy Spirit is in you, you can't walk away and save your own life, even if you want to. Even if you are the biggest chicken in the room right now, and you're thinking, yeah, if they told me I had to renounce Jesus and save my life, I'd do it, but I know Jesus is my Lord, but I'd still, I'm too much of a chicken. You know what would happen in that moment? You know what I think would happen in that moment? I think you'd get up there and you'd start to go, yeah, I, I, you're gonna say, you intend to say, I renounce Jesus. You know what would come out? Jesus is Lord. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit owns your tongue. And you'd be like, wait a minute, that's not what I meant. What I meant was, Jesus is Lord. And you would die well. It's okay. Um, see, look, if the Holy Spirit is in you, you can't deny Christ even to save your life. Um, by the way, if I'm wrong, and you can, according to the writer of Hebrews, you're lost forever. Okay, but, but let me just say this. Uh, if you're afraid that you've apostatized, you haven't. Because you can't do this accidentally. This is not a, oops, I messed up and now I'm, I'm lost forever. No. And by the way, if you have concern about it, um, then you're not. Because if you want to be saved, you will be. If you go, Jesus, save me, please, he will. And that's forever. So I want you to, to stop, you know, fearing that. Because the words will be given you to what to say. Because the Holy Spirit is in you and you belong to him. And he guarantees your salvation. You go, great, but how do we understand friends and family who once claimed Jesus but now reject him or ignore him? How, how do we understand pastors and Christian leaders who have deconverted? You know, people who used to teach the gospel are now saying they don't believe it and, and they're poking, you know, uh, making accusations against Christians. How do you understand former followers who live like the world? Well, the Bible gives us two options, two really clear options. And I want you to hear this and think through this. First, uh, they might be, if they, you know, if they form, used to claim Jesus and they walked away, they might be prodigals. Now, if uh, you're not familiar with the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15, I'd encourage you, encourage you to go home and read it. Okay, just go home and read it. Uh, the, there's three stories. Read the last one. Uh, it's the story of the prodigal son. And and in this story, it's about a son who rejects his father. Uh, he dishonors his father. He takes his inheritance and wastes it uh, in living that is uh, opposite of his father's values. But one day he comes to his senses and he decides to go home. And when he comes home, the father welcomes him with open arms and receives him as a son, even though he knows he's not worthy to be a son. See, the thing is, even when we live in a faraway land, uh, we're still a child of the Father, okay? Now, some of you are going, yeah, but can that really happen? Well, okay, let me just tell you, uh, and I asked for permission to share this. Ted Kamina is our Celebrate Recovery pastor. Uh, he spent 40 years as a prodigal. He was raised in a church. They, he was taught about Jesus. He trusted Jesus as a child. As a young man, he walked away, and he spent four decades in uh, adultery and alcoholism and just uh, ignoring God, even though he knew what he was doing was wrong. He came back to Christ about 20 years ago, and God has radically changed his life, redeemed his life, and uses him to lead others to that life-changing relationship. So if you're saying to me, can you really be a prodigal for four decades? Uh, Ted would say, absolutely. See, almost all of us have spent a season as a prodigal, whether it lasted four months or 40 years, uh, but we came to our senses and we came home. So one option is they might be a prodigal. The other option is they might be a pretender. Okay? The Apostle John in 1 John chapter 2 says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they are all not of us. Okay, what's John saying? John is talking about people who claim to know Jesus and then walked away. 
See, these are people who join with us in worship, who attend, who sing, who serve. They might even be people who teach. But they have not experienced a life-changing relationship with Jesus. They're being religious, often trying to excel at devotion because they're trying to earn something that is a gift. They're trying to you know, imitate something that other people have because uh, either there's reward in it or they just, it's what they know. But, but they are, are exhibiting external conformity, not internal transformation. And so they walk away and they call it a lie. They reject the truth that they were surrounded by but never surrendered to. They reject the truth that was all around them, but they never embraced it or surrendered to it. That's what pretenders look like. Now, this is a, a difficult reality for many of us who have loved ones who have fallen away. And I'm going to guess that's practically everyone in the room who's a follower of Jesus. You got loved ones you're praying for. Maybe you grew up with them in church. Maybe you, uh, you know, served together and now they're, they're far from God. Here's the thing. You and I cannot tell who is a prodigal and who is a pretender. We don't know. We really don't know who's a prodigal and who's a pretender because we can't see their hearts. So we don't know. Did they have a life-changing relationship with Jesus and they're living in rebellion or were they just pretending? Look, I can't answer that question, but the truth is I can't answer that question about you. I can't see your heart. I don't know what's going on inside of you. You, you know who I know about? That's me. You know who you're certain about? That's you. You and God know the condition of your heart. And, and by the way, if you're here and you've just been going through the motions and playing the games, stop. Get honest. Surrender to Jesus and let him change your life because we don't want to play games. We don't want to pretend. We want you to experience that life-changing relationship with Jesus. We want you to experience eternal life. We want you to know that heaven is your destiny. So again, if you're here and you want to talk about it, there's connect cards all around you. Prayer team, after the service, pastors out there, if you're online, uh, just let the online hosts know. They'd be glad to have a private conversation with you, or you can email us at the church. We will follow up with you, and we'll talk with you this week because we want you to surrender to Jesus and experience eternal life. Now, if you know that you belong to God, I want you to have the assurance of salvation because eternal security results in power. Eternal security results in power. When you grasp that heaven is your eternal destiny, it changes your attitude and it changes your perspective on life. Okay, I just, I just want you to know this. This is the, the result of the gospel in you. It's supposed to change you and it changes your attitude and it changes your, your perspective. First of all, it gives you confidence. Okay, it, it ought to give you confidence. After all, the apostle Paul wrote, I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Look, Paul was confident in God. He was confident in his salvation. And, and look, knowing that heaven is your final destiny ought to fill us with courage. No matter the circumstances, no matter the situation, no matter what we're facing. I mean, think about it. This is the Apostle Paul's words in, in Romans chapter eight. He says, for I am sure... Again, there's that confidence that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor COVID, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. I don't think he wrote the COVID part. I just threw that in. <laughs> Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So what can separate us from God? <laughs> so what can separate you from God? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely. You, look, that ought to uh, give you confidence to live boldly for Jesus. That ought to give you confidence to live fearlessly for Jesus. And right now, fear is, is prevalent in our culture like never before. Well, I can't say like never before, just in my lifetime. Okay? And, and, and it's everywhere, and it's plaguing people, and people are afraid of this and afraid of that, and what if this happens, and what if that happens? And, and can I just tell you that we ought to live fearlessly no matter what the future brings. And, and the, 
look, fear is going to grow, and, and with Christianity, we're gonna, there's going to be more and more attacks against biblical Christianity, and we ought to be the people who are confident that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So, hopefully, security results in confidence in your life, and security results in joy. In joy. Again, Romans chapter 8, the apostle says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Do you, do you know what Paul just said there? It doesn't matter what goes on in this world if you know that heaven is your destiny. That, that, that's what he's saying. Look, keep it in perspective. Understand that your future, if you're a follower of Jesus, your future is only going to improve. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, it only gets better. You go, yeah, but it's going to hurt getting there. Paul says you won't care. But the present sufferings are not worth comparing. By the way, Paul suffered more than you. He, he did. I'll, I'll put his suffering up against any of ours. Uh, there's some people in third world countries right now, people that are getting persecuted, that they, they might stand a chance, but not one of us does. You see, our future is only going to get better. It ought to fill us with joy. Look, we can celebrate God's goodness every single day. We can celebrate our blessings every single day with that confidence that, look, nothing can separate us from God's love and it's only going to improve. How do you not have a good attitude with that? How do you not look at life and go, God, uh, you know, today it, it may be a day of sorrow, it may be a day of pain or grief or failure, but all you have to do is think about the fact that one day you're going to inhabit a place where God says there's no more suffering or sorrow or death or pain or politics. Amen. Okay? And, and if you know that, if you know that all things are made new, let that fill you with joy. See, heaven is going to be so good that nothing bad in this world can touch it. That, that's our reality. And, and by the way, if you want to really impact people, if you want to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, confidence in your future and joy in the moment are your superpowers. Confidence in your future and joy in this moment really are your superpowers. Those are the things that are going to impact people and make them want to follow Jesus like you. So my prayer for you, is that you know that heaven is your destiny and that that reality results in a life of confident joy. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for adopting us as your children. Thank you for equipping us with your spirit and sending us out to be your servants in this world. God, thank you for the privilege that it is to represent you and thank you for the promise that heaven is ahead of us, that our future only gets better, and that nothing in this world can change that. So God, uh, we rejoice in your grace for those days and those moments when we are faithless, uh, and we wanna do better. So empower us to live for you, to love for you, to live each day with courage, with faith, and with joy, so that people can know that Jesus is alive and he's changed us. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.